Well, hello. Good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Rick, and I typically preach here on Sundays. If this is your first time here, I'd like to say welcome to our church family. We're really glad that you're here with us. We would love to get to know you a little bit better. And so there is a connection card on the chair in front of you. If you'll take a few moments to fill that out, take it to our Welcome Center after service. We have a gift that we will give you as our way of saying thanks for being here. And uh, like I said, we would love to know you a little bit better. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3, and uh, we are in the middle of a series. It's actually just a two-part mini-series, so technically it's the end, on uh, on warning, called warning. And you have to bear with me today, because uh, I spoke too soon two weeks ago when I bragged about not getting the flu for like 10 years, and I don't think I have the flu, but definitely I think my kids have it. So my nose is starting to run, my throat's been hurting, and so I've created a quarantine for myself right up here. I've been staying away from everybody. It's hard because it's like, you know, I only work one day a week. So if I can, as long as I can push through today, I'm good. I'm kidding. I work more than one day a week. It's a little joke that we have with, uh, with ministers on staff. But anyways, so I'm not feeling the greatest. So if I cough or sneeze or something like that, as long as you're not sitting in the first two rows, you're good. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. But seriously, my son is so great. Uh, He blessed me with throwing up on me a couple days ago. So that was really nice. And then uh, when I picked him up, uh, he decided to wipe his mouth and wipe it on my face. Then he sneezed in my eye. So that was nice. And, uh, you know, nobody warned me about the bad things with kids. It's just usually you see the highlight reel. But man, you know, having kids is not for sissies, that's for sure. So he's been up all night, and Piper, she wasn't feeling too well, and um, she got sick as well, and so it's just kind of like, man, you know, having kids is tough. It's really rewarding, and it's really good, but at the same time, nobody warned you about all that stuff. You know what it's like to get somebody else's throw up in your mouth? It's a terrible experience, (laughs) but that's the way it goes. That's what it's like being a parent. You know, Paul, last week, he warned us, um, for those of us who are in Christ, that there are things that we can experience. There are things that we can go through. There are warnings um, that we have as a Christian that kind of, there's signs that are put up before us to not go that way. And if you remember from last week in Philippians chapter 3, in the first seven verses, Paul said, there are people who are trying to tempt you to boast and put confidence in the flesh. In fact, they were specifically called Judaizers. These Judaizers went into the Christian church and they said, in order for you to truly be saved, you have to get circumcised. You have to become a Jew of the flesh. And so they put their boasting, they put their confidence and their ethnicity and their race and who they were. And Paul says, if you place confidence in the flesh, ultimately, it will lead to disbelief. And disbelief, disobedience, leads to falling from grace. That's the danger. That's what's at stake. Paul says, look, if anybody had any reason to put confidence in the flesh, it's me. I was born in the right family. I had the right kind of skin color. I was a Jew of my nation. I belonged to the right school of thought. I was a Pharisee. I had the right upbringing. I had the right knowledge. I had the right social status. I knew who everyone who should have been known, I I, I knew them. If anybody had any reason to be confident in the flesh, on a basis to appeal to God for righteousness, it was me. And he says, I don't even measure up. And so we ended last week with Paul really kind of saying in verse 7, really blatantly, that I count these things as loss in comparison with knowing Christ. That when I stand before God, it is my faith in Christ Jesus that serves as a basis for my justification, my right standing with God. It is not my flesh. It is not my money. It is not my person. It is my faith in Christ. And so we all have this same level playing field, that the Apostle Paul himself, the only thing that made him right before God was faith in Christ. That's what he shared with the church at Philippi. And that same thing is true for us today. It is about the circumcision of the heart. And so we're going to pick right up where we left off with another warning that we get from Paul in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 8, where Paul says this, "'Indeed, I count everything as loss.'" Because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish, garbage, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. It is not through circumcision. 
that my righteousness comes. It is through faith, the logical acceptance of certain facts about the person and resurrection of Jesus, as well as trust that leads to obedience. It is my faith, Paul says, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings and become like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or I am already perfect, But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if anything, if any of you think otherwise... God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. So the first thing that Paul does is says, look, I don't, I don't place confidence in the flesh. That does not serve as a grounds for my justification before God. My justification before God comes by grace through faith at the time of baptism for good works. That is what I put my hope and my trust in. But he says, I'm not already obtaining perfection. I'm still not perfect. Even though I can stand before God 100% justified, declared not guilty, I haven't actually obtained it. I am pressing on. I am moving forward. There is still more work to be done. And so Paul bases the hope of his salvation in Christ in Christ, not in himself. But does that mean that he doesn't have something to look forward to? And this is kind of an obvious conclusion, right? If we are saved by grace through faith in Christ and God declares us not guilty, we may be tempted to think, well, okay, there's nothing else for me to do. I've already won. I've already obtained the prize. I'm already declared not guilty. Does that mean that I can go on sinning because God has given me his grace? Paul says absolutely no. You see, the interesting thing about grace that we've been talking about is grace is imputed. It's given to us. When we are saved, it's called the imputed righteousness of Christ. The word imputation is a biblical word. It means to declare to be so. It's a banking term. It would literally mean they would use this in a court of law. If somebody had to go to court, they would come to a person and they would declare them not guilty despite the immense amount of debt that they had. And when we are saved, God speaks. He declares not guilty perfect, righteous. He declares the credit of Jesus Christ to us on our behalf. And that is really, really good news. But for anybody who's been a Christian for any amount of time, you know, are you perfect? No, absolutely not. Just start to talk to the people around you and you'll find out you're not perfect. When you came up out of the baptistry, you sinned, you messed up, you made mistakes. And Paul shares that with us. Even though we have obtained the righteousness through Christ on the basis of faith, that doesn't mean that we are not imperfect people who still need to press on, who still need to move forward. And so that's what Paul says in verse 12. Not that I have already obtained it or I am already becoming perfect. It's not that I am actually a perfect person. The righteousness of Christ has been given to me that in the eyes of God, I am made perfect. But I am still pressing on. I am still moving forward. Now, in the immediate context, what does Paul mean that he hasn't obtained it? And really, scholars kind of debate two issues. Number one, Paul may be talking about his missionary work. That maybe Paul wasn't speaking to his moral perfection, that he's speaking to his job as an apostle, that he hasn't finished the race. There's still work for him to do. Whereas I think a better interpretation, the immediate context, Paul is talking about his moral perfection or sinlessness. That Paul is saying, look, even though I am right standing with God on the basis of my faith, there is still work for me to do. There is still progress to be made. I still have to press on. And so Paul gives us this very important warning. Yes, Paul was saved on the basis of faith alone in Christ, but God's work isn't done yet. And if that was true for the Apostle Paul, guess who also that's true for? You and I. God isn't finished with you yet. God is still working on you, working through you, working in you. And so what does Paul do? He says, I press on. This word press on in ancient Greek literature, it literally means a foot race where you can see the finish line. 
You can see the, the line in front of you, and you are in a race to cross that line. Paul says, I am running a race. I can see the finish line. I'm running towards it. And it's used in the present tense, which literally means this. I keep on pressing on. I haven't given up. I haven't taken God's grace for granted. I'm still moving forward. There is still work to be done in me. You know, Paul keeps pressing on in his Christian life and his his mission as an apostle because he wants to get the prize. You know, in uh, ancient times, they would have this prize after they would accomplish this goal. Um, The king would actually be um, an observer. He would watch the Olympic Games. And so they would wrestle, they would compete, they would run races. And the person who won the race, the king would call up to the stands. He would say, come up here. And the winner would ascend the steps and he would stand next to the king. And the king uh, would give him a crown. And it was shaped like a wreath and he would place it on his head. And it was the victory crown that you would get for finishing the race. You won, you completed, you got the prize. And that's what Paul says I'm looking forward towards. Even in his older age as an apostle, there is still work to be done in me. Paul is 60 plus years old, which today it's really, that's not very old. And for those of you who are 60 plus years old, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, we live in a very blessed time to where now we're living into our 80s, 90s, 100s. It's a truly great thing. But you kind of usually topped out in the 60s back in ancient Greek literature times, in the Greco-Roman world, you didn't live very long. I mean, a lot of people died just from tooth decay alone. And so here is Paul in his older age, putting it in context. It would be like somebody in their 90s or in their low 100s saying, there is still work to be done. I am still moving on. I am still pressing forward. Think about that kind of perspective. Do we have that kind of perspective? Do we still look at ourselves and say, God is still at work in me? There's still work to be done. There's still more to be learned. I haven't finished this race yet, but that's the route that I'm going. That's the direction that I'm heading. Paul used this kind of language in other uh, passages of Scripture. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way as to take the prize. Everyone who competes in the games trains with strict discipline. They do it for a crown that is perishable, but we do it for a crown that is imperishable. We get a prize. That's what we're pressing on towards. There's still work to be done. In 2 Timothy chapter uh, 4, this is the last letter that Paul wrote before he was actually beheaded in Rome. And Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, the crown of righteousness is laid up for me which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but who, to all who crave his appearing. That means everybody who finishes the race gets a crown. And Paul says, that's what I'm looking forward towards. I am looking forward to God in that final day saying, come on up here, Paul. Come on up here, Rick. You kept the faith. You finished the race. You didn't give up. Here is a crown of righteousness for you. You win. You get the prize. That's what Paul says, I'm working towards. And that's what we should be working towards. But here's the danger. Here's the warning. The Judaizers were saying, no, 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 no. Look at the flesh. Look at the circumcision. Boast in what you can do physically. Look at how much money you can make. Look at what groups you can belong to. Look at how high you can ascend the political spectrum. Look at how much money you can make at your job and what kind of power you can have. Look at all the material things that you can collect. Put your confidence in the things that are achievable and attainable in this life. And Paul says, that is confidence in the flesh. And in that, I count as loss in comparison with knowing Christ. That's the perspective that Paul has. That's the perspective that we should have. And the warning is simply this. To put confidence in the flesh is to lose sight of the cross. And to lose sight of the cross is to lose sight of who you are and why you're here. And so Paul says, look, I have not obtained this perfection yet, but I am moving on. Look what he says in verse 15 of Philippians chapter 3. He says, as many who are perfect, or better translated like this, as many who are mature. This word perfection means teleos. And so remember, it's it's this already but not yet kind of parallel that Paul uh, positions in Scripture. 100% already declared perfect in the eyes of God, but not yet. There's still work for us to do. We're still moving forward. And Paul says, look, for those of you who are mature, 
For those of you who have the right perspective, I want you to understand that the job isn't over. There's still work to be done. He says in verse 13, or excuse me, the following verses, he says, let us have this attitude. For those of you who are mature in verse 15, let us have this attitude. Think like this. What does Paul want us to think? It's simply this. All of the flesh that the Judaizers put confidence in is rubbish. It isn't necessarily unimportant. It's not most important. It's not as if money doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the most. It's not as if exercising and moving your body doesn't matter. Paul put it like this to Timothy, a young man in the faith. He says, physical training is important, but it's worthless without godliness. And so we can gain so much in the flesh and yet lose so much more. And so Paul says, if you have this attitude, I want you to think like this. Knowing Jesus is more important. Look at the big picture. Remember last week we ended with this, what Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world, but in the end forfeit his soul? And so yes, we get the money, the power, the wealth, the influence, the houses, the cars, the things, the electronics, the bank account, the retirement, all the trust that this world can offer. We abstain from the coronavirus and we don't get sick and die. Yes, we've made it. But then we stand before God and we don't get the crown. What is that profit to you is what Jesus says. And that's the same perspective that Paul has. And so he says, look, If any of you have a different attitude, God will reveal that to you. Here's the question. How does God reveal the wrong kind of attitude in us? How in the world are we going to have the right attitude and know where we go wrong to avoid those warning signs? Well, it's through the Word. Studying God's Word. Opening up to see what this Bible has to say. And you know what? I do believe on the basis of faith in Christ and the trustworthiness of the Word of God, that there are things that go on in your mind that the Holy Spirit convicts you of, and you say, that's a bad attitude. That is a wrong perspective. And we get tempted with the flesh. It is so alluring. It's so powerful. And there are so many things that we want to accomplish. And it is so easy for me and for everybody in this room to lose the eternal perspective. But Paul says, look, have this attitude. Knowing Christ is more important, and it is better. And I trust that God will reveal when you go wrong. In verse 16, he goes on to say this, however, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. This standard in the Greek literature, it meant measuring stick, canon, rule. He says, even though we may not have this attitude, nevertheless, let us behave as if we do. One of my favorite people in the entire world, haven't talked to her in years, her name was Janet Maple. She was the most kind woman I have ever met. She was the wife of the preacher of the church that I grew up in. And you know what? In life, sometimes you got to fake it until you make it. And that's what Janet Maple told me. And isn't that true? I told you last week, I hate vegetables. But I eat them and say, man, this is good. This is delicious. You ever notice when you lie to yourself long enough, you start to believe it? When you fake it, you start to make it. Actions and then emotions come. You start to acquire taste. Look, you know the person that invented carbonated water? First person. He sat there. He took a drink. And he said, hmm, I wish this hurt. (laughs) I wish this hurt. Took a drink of water. Who drinks carbonated water? My wife is obsessed with it. She'll take a drink and she'll go, ah, it burns. I'm like, why would you do that to yourself? Carbonated water is by far the worst thing we could ever drink. It's terrible. I do like soda, but I just don't get it. It's like carbonated water, no thanks. But uh, it's like the longer you drink it, you start to acquire the taste. You know what I'm talking about? And you're like, man, this is actually delicious. There are things that people eat. They don't like eating it or drinking it, but you fake it until you make it. It's the same thing is true for marriage. There are times in your marriage, you're like, I really don't like this other person. You fake it until you make it. Actions and then attitude will follow. Self-discipline, exercising. For those of you who have overcome obesity and you exercise and you feel good, you hate exercising at first. But then the longer you do it, the better you feel, and then you start to crave it. You start to want it. It becomes a habit. It is the same thing with spiritual disciplines, guys. There is no difference. How many people really, truly enjoy, don't raise your hands, okay? When you first started attending church and you worked your way up to giving 10% of your income, Okay. How many of you really enjoyed the beginning part of that process? Did you not first look at everything you gave and was like, wow, this is a lot of sacrifice and loss? Was there not the temptation to look at what other people have and say, look at the kind of house we could have, the kind of cars we could drive, the things we could acquire? But now it's a joy. 
It's a pleasure. I love, I love it. One of the best things that I love doing is giving to the Lord. It's great. I enjoy it. At first, it is not enjoyable. It comes at a great cost. But then as you mature, actions start to affect attitude. You fake it until you make it. It's discipline. It's Christian character. It's the same thing with spiritual discipline. It feels good to lash out in anger when somebody hurts you, doesn't it? Doesn't that feel good? Isn't it hard to overcome that? But then the longer that you do it, the more self-control that you have, it's a lot easier, and then you enjoy it, and Christian maturity takes over. Fake it until you make it. It's one of the best things that Janet ever told me, and maybe that can help you as well. And I think that's what Paul's saying here. We still have a standard. We still have a rule. Christian character takes over. Where emotion's lacking, character takes over. We act on character rather than emotion when our attitude goes wrong. And so that's what Paul's trying to teach us here. And so in this first section of Philippians chapter 3, Paul shows us really what's at stake in salvation. Without faith in Christ, we cannot stand before God on the final day and get that crown. And so getting this right is really, really important, not just for our eternal salvation, but even for the spiritual health of the church. It matters now. Look what Paul goes on to say in verse 17. He says, join one another in following my example, brothers. That's what I love about Paul. He says, look, in case you didn't get my teaching, let me show you my example. Let me give you an easy point of reference. He says, carefully observe those who walk according to this pattern that we set for you. Timothy, who was sent to the church of Philippi, Epaphroditus, who was sent back to the church of Philippi, Luke, who probably traveled with Paul, Paul himself, look to the people who put Christ first as a pattern, as an example for you to follow. He says in verse 18, for as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. It's really unfortunate. He says their end with tears. You ever gone to church and you feel like, man, they're really glad people are going to hell. (laughs) I've been to churches like that. I've heard people like that. I've heard preachers scream from the top of their lungs about people who are not Christian are going to die and burn to hell and they better not come back to church unless they change. And to me, that's the exact opposite of the gospel. We don't come changed to church. We come to church to be changed, to be transformed, to look different, right? Right? You don't get healthy and then go to the hospital. You go to the hospital and then you can get healthy. But Paul specifically says, look, there are people who are enemies of the cross. Yes, people are lost. Their end is destruction, Paul says. And he says, this is how you can know somebody who's on the wrong path. Here's a warning sign. Their God is their belly. Their glory is their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. And so Paul's previous point is this. Keep in step with the Christian faith. Keep walking. Keep pressing forward. Keep doing. God's work is not done yet. And he says, look, join me. Follow my example. Observe those who are around you. And then he talks about these enemies of the cross. Well, I think in the immediate context, obviously, the first people he's probably thinking about are Judaizers. People who place their confidence in the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, he says, Those of you who seek to be justified through circumcision have fallen from grace. Watch out! Warning! Don't place confidence in the flesh. Same thing's true for us. There were also Gnostics. Gnostics believe this. Flesh is evil. So you got one group of people who are placing too much confidence in the flesh. You got another group of people who have said the flesh is so evil that Jesus was actually not human, that he really didn't die on a cross. These are enemies of the cross. These are people who teach things that are false. And Paul, with tears, not with gratitude, not with thanksgiving, We shouldn't be happy that people were lost. After all, we're only saved by grace. It's not anything that we can do. I don't take joy in knowing that people are going down the wrong path. It's not a good thing. It's not something that makes me happy. And Paul says, I weep. I weep knowing 
that there are enemies of the cross. His heart is filled with grief and pain and tears because Paul cares about their eternal destiny. One of the marks of a true Christian is they care about the eternal destiny of the people around them. They care. Paul's not speaking from an attitude of animosity. You know, who is the real enemy in this world? Is it your next door neighbor who doesn't believe or think like you? No, I don't think so. I think they're a victim of the enemy. I think people who have a different belief mindset other than what the Bible teaches is a victim of materialism or atheism or flat-out rejection of, of Christianity. They are a victim of the enemy. They are not the enemies themselves necessarily, but they can be. They can become enemies of the cross. I try to give people the benefit of the doubt and not view them through the lens of an enemy. And most people, I think, are like that. Most people don't go out of their way to be a Judaizer or a Gnostic or intentionally try to destroy the truthfulness of Christianity or the cross. And I think we have to have the wisdom to know the difference and to see the distinction. But the going rate attitude should not be joy at their destruction. We shouldn't speak truth for the simple fact of winning an argument so that we can feel good about ourselves. It's about the eternal perspective. That's what Paul's trying to teach us. Here's the warning, okay? I like to picture it like this. I'm driving down a road, and there's a fork in the road, and there's a big warning sign on the left, and it says, confidence in the flesh. Don't go that way. And then the other warning sign on the right is not just confidence in the flesh, but it's Gnosticism. It's placing this idea that all flesh is evil and that there's no work to do And that if you are going to attain what God wants you to attain, you have to get completely out of the flesh and just focus on this mystical experience. Well, if there's only two wrong ways to go, what's the most logical thing to do? Turn around. Get on the right path. Find the right road. What is the right road? What is the right thing to do? Well, Paul says, have this attitude. Walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now he says their end is destruction. The God that they serve is what? It's their appetite. The God of their belly is what he says. They actually had a God that they would worship through eating. They would eat and eat and eat. The the, the Greeks and the Romans, they would throw up and they would eat and eat and eat more. They would do the same thing with worshiping Bacchus, the God of wine. They would drink and drink and drink until the point where they couldn't hold it anymore. And uh, once they were able to release the wine in their system, then they would keep drinking some more. That was their act of worship. What a powerful image for what the God of this world has to offer. Satisfy yourselves. Look out for you. Do what feels right. If it feels good, do it. Sexual immorality doesn't matter. That's what brings you pleasure. Do it. Eating, drinking, be merry. Don't control your appetite. Don't take care of your body. Go out there and earn as much money as you possibly can if it makes you feel good. If that is not the God of our culture, I don't know what is. He says, their God is the God of their belly. They do what feels good. Whereas Christianity says, even if you don't have the kind of attitude that you should have, do it anyways. Have the character to follow through. Have this attitude and this mindset if you're mature. And so evil thoughts, sexual sin, overeating, overexercising, overindulging, drug addiction. There are so many things that Paul says they have set their mind on earthly things. Jesus put it like this in Matthew 16 when Peter was talking to Jesus and Jesus says, look, I'm going to be crucified. And Peter says, oh, no, 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 no. That's not God's plan. I'm sure of it. And look what Jesus had to say to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me for you do not have the mind of the things of God, but the things of men. What are you thinking about this morning? What has your mind? What captivates your thoughts? What are you pressing towards? What race are you running? Is it the rat race of materialism or is it the heavenly race of eternal relationship with God? Paul brings it home in verse 20 with simply this, our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our citizenship, this is a strong word for those who are at Philippi. The majority of people at Philippi are Roman citizens. They have a a language that they speak, which is Latin, a dress code, customs, holidays, ceremonies, worshiping the emperor. That that was their God of their day. They had Caesar worship. They worshiped that, that, um, uh, the Caesar who sat on the throne. And Paul says, look, we are a little colony on this life of heaven. 
That's our true citizenship. He put it like this in Ephesians 2.19, Therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens of the saints and members of God's own household. Paul says we eagerly await for our heavenly home. That's what we're working towards. That's who we belong to. That's who we are. And if we are a citizen of heaven, we should act like it. Right? Isn't that true? If we belong to Jesus and Jesus belongs to us, Paul says we belong not to this world. We have dual citizenship. We might be here temporarily, but our eternal home is with Jesus. And then he says this, not only is heaven our home, but who, by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself, will transform our lowly bodies to be like his on that glorious day. And here's Paul getting close to the end of his life. And he says, God is not done yet, both inside and outside. That God is not just working on me as a Christian person in my character, but one day God promises something very special. We will resurrect and have a new body, and that's my aim. I love how C.S. Lewis put it. He put it like this, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. You will get neither. I'll end with this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Paul's main point is a warning. God isn't finished yet. I'm pressing on. I'm forgetting those things behind, but I'm pressing on. I'm moving forward. There's a race to be won. And I love how he puts it here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. He says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into his image with intensifying glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. He says, we're being transformed now. Not in the future, but we will be. I'm not waiting. I am being transformed into God's image right now. And one day, my body will match up with my spirit. Think about that. One day my body will match up with my spirit. Can we say that? Can we honestly say that our body is going to have to catch up to who we are on the inside one day? I sure hope so. And if not, I want to encourage you, move in that direction. God is at work. Don't give up. He's on the move. Keep running forward. The work is just beginning.